Has anyone here ever been in a complicated relationship? Just show of hands quickly. Show of hands. Great. To those with your hands up, thank you for being honest. And to those that didn't, yeah, I'm sorry, but you might be the complicated relationship here, and, and that's fine. That's totally fine. My name is Toby Lee. I'm a PhD student studying to be a scientist, and I'm also in a complicated relationship myself. I'm in a complicated relationship with science. <gasps> My uh, relationship with science started as early as I can remember. Studying science was a chore that everyone had to do in school, and the main metric for doing well was dependent on how much you could memorize and regurgitate random facts and equations only to forget them after test day. What was the point? And if I could be honest, I didn't quite know what it meant to be a scientist, except in the textbooks, they're often white, old men with beards. And as you can see, I'm not white, <laughs> nor can I grow a beard. <laughs> you laugh, but the sad thing is I've tried. <laughs> But my relationship with science did change during my second year of college when I did an internship to work with communities and scientists in Tanzania, East Africa. For 40 years, this group of scientists has been studying a specific bacteria in the lab that when consumed can confer health benefits, also known as a probiotic. More interestingly, they were able to package this bacteria and because bacteria, they grow so fast, when you mix this package with milk, it could produce up to 100 liters of probiotic yogurt. It was exciting research. But it wasn't what changed my relationship with science. What changed my relationship with science was actually a woman I met whom I affectionately called Mama Joyce. Now, Mama Joyce was a survivor of domestic abuse. During one of our chats, she told me that among the terrible parts of being abused was that feeling of paralysis and feeling that there was nothing that you can do. But then came a turning point, a research partnership between scientists and community leaders teaming up to teach rural communities on how to make probiotic yogurt outside the lab using just basic kitchen equipment. And among those who received this training was Mama Joyce. This research partnership helped Mama Joyce to rediscover herself as an entrepreneur, where she would then start her own yogurt business. It helped her to become a leader, where she would work with scientists to promote health and educate communities about the science of probiotics and fermented foods. And as someone who experienced domestic abuse, Mama Joyce now uses her own platform to support children of domestic abuse providing them with funds so that they can go to school, a new home where they're safe, and a new life where they're not victimized. Now, isn't that the point of science? To push the very boundaries of human knowledge in service to people and communities. That was when my relationship with science changed. Having seen the impact that science can have on communities, it became my aspiration to be that for others. But with that said, I'm not here to romanticize my relationship with science. Remember, it's complicated, and the truth is, science isn't perfect. There are problems. The lack of funding for research community engagement, the toxic mentality that a scientist be judged by the number of publications they have rather than the impact of their work on communities, systemic racism, systemic sexism, elitist attitudes, all of these issues combined are what makes science so exclusive, something that is not open for people to understand and probably not something for people to trust. And as we've seen from the pandemic and from the effects of climate change, when people don't trust science during times of crisis, the consequences can be so severe. However, science is changing. It is approaching a new era more determined than ever to expand its reach across society. And as such, I would like to highlight just four ways that science is trying to become more inclusive. Number one, science is lowering economic barriers. According to recent reports, over 70% of college students are finding it difficult to afford their education, with over half having to cut down on basic needs just to make ends meet. 
students are finding it harder now than ever to develop their interest in science, which is often explored through after-school extracurriculars. About three years ago, a group of young scientists and I started a unique training program at our university to introduce students to health research free of charge. Since its establishment, the program has enrolled over 300 students. And while that might not be a large number, our surveys show that over 90% of students felt that the program had broadened their interest in science and about half saying that it influenced their career choices. That's 150 new scientists and why we need to invest in students. Number two, science is making room for everyone. Another way that science is trying to become more inclusive is by creating safe and empowering spaces for those that don't look male, pale, and stale. <laughs> it's a good one, I know. I know, yeah. An example that I would like to highlight comes from a good friend. Her name is Carrie Boyce, and Carrie was involved in starting the world's first all science themed drag show in Toronto, Canada, which was cleverly named Science is a Drag. <laughs> Clever. For those who are less familiar, drag shows are performances that play with gender expression through extravagant costumes, music, and dance. It is also a major art form of the queer community. In the case of Science is a Drag, scientists dress in drag often for the first time, and deliver unique performances in queer-friendly spaces that are inspired by their research. More than just entertainment, Science as a Drag has become a space for open discussion on science that centers itself on the perspectives of LGBTQ people. Isn't that cool? Number three, science is teaching students to build bridges. If there's anything that we can learn from the pandemic is that at a time of crisis and uncertainty, effective science communication saves lives. Learning this lesson, a group of young scientists and I have organized these yearly conferences called ComSciCon Canada, which brings scientists from across the country to learn about effective science communication. To help these scientists better engage with you, we bring in experts from many sectors, from artistic visualization to comedy to indigenous knowledge. More than just breaking down barriers, we're teaching future scientists how to build more bridges. Kind of like this TED Talk. Number four, science is shifting from participants to community partners. As part of my PhD studies, I work with a community of sex workers from Nairobi, Kenya, a group that scientists and clinicians from the University of Manitoba have worked with for the past 40 years in efforts to study infectious disease risk, prevention, and treatment. And in 2019, I went to meet this community for the first time. Through our meetings, I was able to learn the stories of how these women entered into sex work and together the challenges they faced from poverty to lack of access to education and opportunities to domestic abuse. And because sex work is work, it became one of the few means that these women had to financially support themselves and their children. One particular conversation that has really followed me since this meeting was with a community leader by the name of Joyce Adiambo. Joyce Adiambo reminded me of an older sibling someone who is always looking out for you and made sure that you felt supported. Joyce was a pillar of strength for this community of women, a survivor who has lived with HIV for the past 20 years and a survivor of cervical cancer. During one of our conversations, Joyce said to me, Toby, as a sex worker for 20 years, I have been stigmatized, discriminated against, and I could have died. But this research community accepted me for who I am, and they saved me. This community has now become my community, a community where I can share my experience with others and shape science in a way 
that truly supports people like me. End of quote. I think that science offers its best when it becomes the very means that bring people together and build communities. Communities where ideas and lived experiences are exchanged amongst people from different walks of life, transforming individual realities to innovations and solutions. In essence, science doesn't just benefit from building communities, it needs them. And as I conclude this talk, I want to leave you with these final requests. To those who work in science, can we just give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> like, thank you for your commitment and for your resilience in facing the challenges of being in science. I ask that you please never let that passion wane. Instead, to keep it alive by sharing it with others. To those who are thinking of going into science, I can confirm you do not need facial hair. Exhibit A. You can do it. There's room for everyone. There's room for you. You can make a difference. And to the rest of the room, everyone else, at a time of mass polarization, when legitimate and rigorous science is being questioned, I ask that you please don't give up on a scientist. Either you're talking to a friend or you're reading your uncle's social media posts, which, you know, kind of gets kind of weird. Uh, or a politician comes knocking on your door. Please speak up for science. Like any relationship, there are ups and downs. And this period of mistrust in science can probably go in the down category. But I believe that a stronger, healthier, more inclusive science is within reach. And as long as we work hand in hand, we can redefine our relationship with science. From complicated to engage, a science where everyone belongs. Thank you. <laughs>